patient also needed a bilateral native nephrectomy. The right colon is being mobilized and the white line of TOLT is being divided. The right colon will be retracted so that the iliac vessels can be accessed. The right colon is mobilized to the hepatic flexure. The lymphatics overlying the iliac vessels are being divided. If there's a retroperitoneal dissection, these lymphatics are ligated and divided to prevent future formation of lymphocele. In a midline position, the incidence of lymphocele is much lower, so one can simply bovie the lymphatics. The right iliac is being exposed. A vessel loop will be placed around the iliac, and again, the lymphatics are ligated. A side-biting Satinsky clamp is used to clamp the iliac vein. A sufficient amount of vein is being exposed so that the Satinsky can be placed easily. At this point, the kidney has been retrieved from the donor room. A left laparoscopic donor nephrectomy was performed. The vascular staple lines are partially divided on the artery and then the vein, and the kidney is flushed. The cannula is carefully placed in the renal artery and cold solution containing heparin is flushed through the vessel. You can see the effluent through the vein is slowly becoming clearer and the kidney is flushed for approximately one minute or until the effluent becomes clear. The staple line has been partially kept in place so that the orientation is clear. The previously placed clips from the laparoscopic donor nephrectomy are replaced by ties. The gonadal vessel is being ligated. The clips are replaced by ties to prevent dislodging of the clips as the kidney is being handled during the transplant. Gerotus fascia is now being sharply dissected away from the kidney. Taking care to preserve the blood supply from the lower third of the kidney to the ureter. The ureter is being demonstrated with its blood supply carefully preserved. The renal vein is inspected, followed by the renal artery. And again, the staple line is kept in place to maintain orientation. A small retractor is placed to expose the iliac veins and keep the lymphatic, the previously ligated lymphatic tissue retracted. Care must be taken when placing this retractor to not damage the vessels. The side-biting Satinsky clamp is placed on the iliac vein, and a venotomy is made using a right-angle scissors. The clamp can be placed either with the handles cephalad or caudad, depending upon what is easier for placement of the kidney. The kidney orientation is carefully identified with the ureter towards the bottom and the bladder. Again, a venotomy is made with the right-angle scissors and extended using the pot scissors. The vessel is irrigated with heparinized saline. A 6-0 proline suture is used to create the anastomosis. Three stay sutures are placed to allow triangulation of the vessel. This triangulation will help prevent any backwalling during the creation of the anastomosis. A suture is placed in the most superior end of the renal vein and then the inferior end. The suture can also be placed in the mid portion of the renal vein to allow for triangulation and opening of the vein. The kidney was placed in an iced sponge so that it can be kept cool during the venous and arterial anastomoses. The sutures are tied into place. Note that the Satinsky clamp prevents any leakage of blood from the iliac vein. A running anastomosis is created end to side from the renal vein to the iliac vein. As you can see, the back wall anastomosis is being performed first. By performing the anastomosis in this fashion, there's minimal handling of the kidney. After completion of the back wall anastomosis, the suture is tied to the inferior stitch. After the last stitch along the back wall, 
the suture is brought to the outside of the anastomosis. And the back wall suture is secured to the most inferior stitch. We then proceed with the front wall anastomosis, again end to side, renal vein to iliac vein, taking care not to catch the back wall during creation of the front wall anastomosis. After the front wall anastomosis is completed, the suture will be secured to the uppermost pre-placed stitch. The last stitch is placed at the corner and the suture is tied on the outside of the vessel. At this point of the procedure, a white bulldog clamp may be placed on the renal vein and the anastomos anastomosis can be tested for any leaks. This is an option that does not always need to be exercised. Attention is then turned to the arterial anastomosis. Covered Fogarty clamps are placed proximally and distally, taking care not to disturb any arterial plaque that may be present in the native artery. A small arteriotomy is made using a number 15 scalpel blade. A number 11 blade may also be used to make the initial arteriotomy. An aortic punch is used to extend the arteriotomy so that the shape of the arteriotomy is circular. Some surgeons prefer an elliptical punch for this arteriotomy. The renal artery is then sutured to the iliac artery in an end-to-side fashion using 6-O-proline in a running stitch. Either the external or common iliac artery may be used to perform this anastomosis depending upon the peripheral arterial disease that is usually present in the recipient as well as the optimal placement of the kidney. And again, the back wall of the arterial anastomosis is performed first. In a living donor transplant, clearly this is an end to side anastomosis, unlike in the deceased donor where a corral patch is available. Care must be taken to ensure that the iliac artery arteriotomy is large enough to prevent any anastomotic stenosis. You can see in this procedure that the white bulldog clamp has been placed on the renal vein. And the previously placed side binding Satinsky was removed, which allows for better exposure for the arterial anastomosis, as well as checking of the venous anastomosis for any bleeding prior to completing the arterial anastomosis. The white bulldog prevents any blood from getting into the kidney transplant. At this point in time, the renal vein white bulldog clamp is removed and kidney reperfusion begins. You can see the clear change in color after removal of the vascular clamps. The renal vein clamp is removed followed by the distal arterial clamp and then the proximal arterial clamp is removed. Some surgeons prefer to keep the distal arterial clamp in place to allow increased perfusion to the kidney. The anastomoses are carefully inspected for any bleeding. Bleeding along the renal hyaline is identified and ligated. Bleeding along the renal capsule is identified and usually controlled by use of electrocautery. Care must be taken when ligating any bleeding points within the hilum or near the lower third of the kidney so that the blood supply to the ureter is carefully preserved and the ureter is not damaged. In a living donor transplant, urine output should be immediately after reperfusion, which is nicely demonstrated here. Attention is then turned to the neoureterocystostomy. The bladder is identified and the muscular layer is divided using electrocautery. The bladder had been previously irrigated with antibiotic solution. In this case, the leash technique is being used as an anti-reflux technique when implanting the ureter. Mucosa is identified. The bladder does tend to be quite vascular and any small bleeding points can be controlled using electrocautery. The mucosa is entered sharply and return of the irrigation ensures placement into the bladder. The ureter has been cut to an appropriate length and spatulated. An absorbable monofilament suture is used to create this anastomosis. 
a proximal and distal stitch is placed, and then a continuous end-to-side anastomosis will be performed. When doing this anastomosis, a small bite should be taken on the ureter side and a much larger bite on the bladder side. A ureteral stent is placed and will be kept in place for four to six weeks and removed by cystoscopy. The ureter is now being sutured into place and you can clearly see the stent in the proper position. A small bite is being taken on the ureter and a large bite on the bladder mucosa. This suture is a continuous mucosa to mucosa stitch. The muscular layer will be reapproximated in a separate interrupted suture. The muscular layer of the bladder is now being reapproximated using an interrupted stitch with monofilament absorbable suture. In the living donor transplant, we expect urine output immediately after reperfusion. If there's an unexpected decrease in urine output when a living donor transplant is being performed, one must consider thrombosis and consider an early return to the operating room. This now concludes our video production of the living donor kidney transplant. We appreciate your time in viewing this video.